Simon. Okay, good. So, uh, welcome uh, to everyone. So, uh, today in uh, um, our seminar, we have the pleasure to have with us Balgoye Oblak from LPTH uh, and uh, CPHT. And he will tell us about berry phases and drift and the KEDV equation. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. So, um, hello everyone, and nice to, to meet you at least uh, virtually. Um, before I start, I would like to thank David, Mark, and Carol for setting up this seminar. It's a pleasure uh, to speak in front of your group, uh, and a bit wider apparently than the Lyon group alone, and uh, I hope you will enjoy my presentation. So, as announced, I'm going to talk about very phases that appear in the KDV equation. This is based on a series of works that I initiated about four years ago, but the main reference for today is really the very last paper in this list, which uh, I wrote a year ago, uh, together with my collaborator, Gregory Kozirev, who is based in Brussels. Now, before I start uh, the talk proper, I would like first to give, wait, I would like first to give a bit of a context to explain uh, where this work really comes from. Indeed, I, indeed, I initially uh, did my PhD in um, quantum gravity in Brussels, uh, and then I moved to Zurich for my postdoc, where uh, my interest started shifting towards lower energy physics and, in particular, hydrodynamics. Uh, and in fact, since about a year and a half now, I've been a postdoc in the Paris region, working in particular uh, on the quantum hall effect. Now, obviously, uh, these three subjects are very, very different, but my point of view about them is sort of unified in that in, that in all those cases, it turns out to be crucial to understand uh, the role of diffeomorphisms, that is, the role of various continuous deformations of continuous media. For example, uh, general relativity is notoriously invariant under arbitrary deformations of space-time, fluid flows can be seen as time-dependent deformations of space, and finally, uh, quantum hole droplets are incompressible and therefore have an infinite dimensional symmetry under deformations that preserve area. In particular, today's talk is really going to be uh, one aspect of this general line of thought because I'm going to argue that fluid flows give rise to time-dependent diffeomorphisms, which in turn generate certain very phases that I initially uh, studied in the gravitational context. So aside from the specific subject of this talk, uh, my hope today is to convey the idea that uh, there's interesting physics to be extracted from the interactions of these, these three uh, seemingly very different fields, and so that's sort of the ideology that I hope to, to convey. Um, one last thing before I actually start, uh, obviously please feel free to interrupt at any point you if you have a question. This is of course always true uh, in any talk, but it's especially true here because this is a Zoom talk, so I don't see you and I cannot read the room. So do feel free to stop me at any point if you have a question. I have actually timed the talk so that you know, we fit easily in one hour, including questions. So just ask away if something is unclear. So, uh, having settled these preliminaries, let me now actually start the talk. Um, I'm going to begin by motivating the subject with an analogy taken from atomic physics. Namely, consider an electron represented here by the red dot, which is orbiting around some atomic nucleus. Then that electron has a spin vector, which I'm representing here by the red arrow. And what Thomas showed about a century ago is that as the electron completes one orbit of its motion around the nucleus, its spin vector doesn't quite return to its initial orientation, but instead undergoes a small rotation. From a modern perspective, the angle of that rotation is in fact a berry phase associated with adiabatic Lorentz boosts. More abstractly, it's really a berry phase that comes from a unitary group action on the Hilbert space of one electron. It is therefore natural to ask if there generally exist berry phases associated with any continuous unitary group action in quantum mechanics. The answer, in fact, turns out to be yes. But one particular implication of, the, of this fact uh, seems not to have been studied much in the literature. And this has to do with deformations of spatial samples where quantum systems live. So with this motivation in mind, today's talk can really be summarized in just two statements. The first statement is that, as I'm going to argue, sample deformations do generally produce berry phases. For reasons that will soon become clear, I'm going to refer to those as Virazora berry phases. The second key statement is that such berry phases are in fact realized dynamically in the KDV equation 
where they contribute to a notion of drift velocity. So this is really the main content of today's talk. Um, the applications of these ideas obviously include some aspects of hydrodynamics, to which I'm going to return repeatedly in the talk. But more remotely, these ideas also apply uh, to the quantum hole effect, uh, because one can imagine deforming a whole droplet adiabatically and thereby generating very phases of the kind I'm going to describe. This is something I'm currently working on uh, with Benoit Estienne. But I should really stress that uh, the focus of, of today's talk is going to be entirely on hydrodynamics, and I'm really not going to mention uh, the whole effect much. So uh, here is now the plan of the talk. I'm first going to introduce Virozoroberry phases in general. Then I will turn to the seemingly unrelated notion of drift in the KDV equation. And finally, I'm going to combine those two concepts and actually show how Virozoroberry phases affect drift velocity in KDV. And finally, let me repeat once more, please do ask any, any technical question on the talk if you have um, something to ask. So uh, let's start with Virozoroberry phases. Uh, here, I'm going to proceed in three steps. First, I'm going to remind you in general what Berry phases are. Then I'm going to compute Berry phases associated with deformations of a circle. And then finally, I'm going to extend this into uh, Virozoroberry phases. Now, Berry phases in quantum mechanics occur when uh, you're considering a quantum system that depends on a certain set of continuous external parameters. Here, I am collectively denoting these parameters by the letter G, because I eventually want you to think of them as uh, specifying a point in a group manifold. But at this stage, you should really think of this notation as just a convenient shorthand for the set of parameters labeling uh, the quantum system. Now, in particular, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian now are parameter dependent. Here, I'm focusing on one particular energy eigenstate whose energy I'm going to assume is isolated and non-degenerate. The question we wish to ask is, what happens when some external experimenter uh, comes up, looks at the system, and decides to change the values of these parameters in time? This corresponds to following a certain path, gt in parameter space, where the index t stresses that parameters are now time dependent. Specifically, we want to solve the Schrodinger equation in such a time dependent setup. It turns out that if parameters are varied slowly enough, i.e. adiabatically, then a wave function that's initially an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian will in fact remain an eigenstate at all later times. And furthermore, if one varies these parameters cyclically, meaning that one starts and ends at the same point in parameter space, then in fact the initial and final wave functions are the same and only differ by a phase. That phase is written here. As you can see, it's the sum of two terms, the first of which is an integral of energy known as the dynamical phase. And the second is the term we're interested in, that's the Berry phase. In particular, note that the Berry phase explicitly involves the parameter dependence of energy eigenstates. So this is a general formula for Berry phases in quantum mechanics. And we're now going to apply it to the case where parameter variations are really given by time-dependent deformations of a spatial sample. For definiteness, let's consider a quantum particle on a circle so that the position of the particle is periodic, as is the corresponding wave function. I'm going to act on such wave functions with deformations, that is, diffeomorphisms. Now, these diffeomorphisms are going to be crucial throughout the talk, so uh, let me give you a few examples of them. Here is a circle where I have distributed uniformly a bunch of particles. I'm going to act on that circle with certain deformations. So here is one example where I have pinched the circle here on the right and thereby attracted all the particles towards that point here on the right. This is one typical example of a deformation of the circle you might conceive. There are, of course, infinitely many more possibilities you might consider. For example, uh, you can pinch the circle at three different points here um, and you can do pretty much anything you want as long as the deformation you're performing is uh, smooth. In particular, you may consider rotations of the circle, which are given by this sort of transformation here, and which in terms of a function, g of x, are given by this very simple formula here, theta being the angle of the rotation. Now, um, in practice, what I want to do is to define a unitary action of deformations on wave functions. That is, for every, uh, are, is there any question? I think I'm hearing some, uh, some people are saying something. No, there's nothing. Okay, fine. Let me know if there's a question, please. Um, so yes, 
I want to define a unitary action of deformations on wave functions. That is, for every deformation g, I want to define a unitary operator u of g. And to define this action, I have to tell you what's the value of this wave function at some point on the circle. Now, for simplicity, I'm going to choose that point to be the point g of x, in which case I define this operator u of g as being the right-hand side of this expression. You may verify that this expression, in fact, defines uh, a unitary operator so that the scalar products of wave functions are preserved. And uh, you may also verify that this is, in fact, a representation of the group of deformations. That is, if you compose two deformations, then the unitary operator implementing that composition is the composition of uh, the individual unitary operators implementing those. So this is exactly the setup we had with Thomas precession. And in particular, we can now ask what happens when some external experimenter uh, shows up and decides to uh, deform the system in a time-dependent manner. That is, someone forces the system to undergo a time-dependent family of deformations. If those deformations are performed adiabatically and cyclically, one expects the system to pick up very phases. Now, in order to actually compute those very phases, I have to tell you something about uh, the wave functions we're going to consider, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. I'm going to assume that these eigenstates are in fact plane waves, so that they're labeled by uh, their momentum k. In that case, the very phase is given in general by the formula I displayed before, which I'm here applying to the case where parameter dependence stems from a unitary group action. And if now you use this formula for these unitary operators, what you find is this compact expression for the very phase. Now, there are two aspects of this formula that I want to stress. First, note that the momentum k of the wave function appears as a parameter here in the very phase. As sec and secondly, notice that the very phase is a functional of this path of deformations. Notice that uh, the parameter space here is manifestly infinite dimensional because you can perform uh, an infinite uh, you have infinitely many linearly independent deformations that you can consider, but despite this di infinite dimension, the very phase is pretty explicit. Now, before I move on, there's just one comment that I want to make about, um, uh, about this very connection here. Indeed, the integrand you can write as a very connection of this form, and I'm mentioning this expression of the very connection because we're going to recover it later in the KDV equation. So please try to remember that the very connection is an expectation value of this Lie algebra valued one form G inverse DG. Yes? Can I ask one question? Sure. Uh, it's a continuous family of, of uh, function JTX? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, if, you, if your question is whether the labels T and X are continuous, yes, they are continuous. Is that okay. your question or? Yeah, it's a question. Yeah, yeah, okay. So yes, I'm just, taking, you know, imagine that you start from the identity in the group of deformations and then just slowly deform your circle, then rotate a little bit, then deform back and deform back into the identity, for example, and you will pick up in general the very phase. Does this answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, good, good. Um, so, okay, uh, we now have an explicit formula for the very phase, which is nice. But in practice, for physical applications, it's often of interest to include in this formula what's called a central charge. In that case, the group of deformations of the circle is extended into what's known as the Virozoro group. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of how the Virozoro group is defined. If you're familiar with two-dimensional conformal field theory, you may know that actually uh, the Virozoro group is precisely um, the symmetry group of such theories. But in practice, for our purposes, all it means to move from deformations to Vero Zero is that we now have to add an extra term in the Berry phase. Indeed, it turns out that the Berry phase is the same as before, plus now a Vero Zero assembler charge C, multiplying this third derivative term. In particular, again, if you're familiar with the, the Vero Zero algebra, this third derivative is in fact a remnant of the term M cube in that algebra. But regardless of details, we now have a very explicit formula for very phases associated with Virozoro transformations. And we can now ask the following question. So far, when I was describing very phases, I, I always mentioned uh, that they were phenomena occurring when some external experimenter shows up and uh, decides to deform the system in a time-dependent manner. But it would be much more pleasing to find a physical system where there is actually no need for an external experimenter. In other words, we want to find a physical system whose dynamics itself gives rise to time-dependent deformations 
that would then give rise to a very phase of this kind. And so that motivation leads us to the KDV equation here. Now, again, before I proceed to section two of the talk, let me ask if there are any questions. If there are no questions, then I can just proceed. Okay, silence means no questions, so it's fine. So uh, let me start then now talking about the KDV equation. So to do this, I'm first going to um, introduce the KDV equation and what's known as its reconstruction. Then I'm going to briefly digress and relate this notion of reconstruction to the actual motion of fluid particles in hydrodynamics. And finally, uh, I'm going to argue that periodic solutions of the KDV equation give rise to well-defined notion of drift velocity. Now, to introduce the KDV equation, consider first a wave profile on the circle. That is, consider a function P, or profile, which is a function of space, and it's in fact periodic in space, and is a function of time. By definition, that function satisfies the KDV equation if this PDE holds. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of why this PD is important or how you derive it. Only note here on the right-hand side that I've added a, a parameter C, which is in fact a zero zero central charge. Indeed, the KDV equation turns out to be closely related to uh, zero zero group theory. And in fact, one can think of this equation as stating that the wave profile is a source of its own deformations. These deformations now are time dependent, and so I'm going to call them as before, GT of X. The whole game we're going to play is to try to find those time-dependent deformations. And in order to do this, we're going to use intuition from hydrodynamics. Indeed, suppose that you have a fluid on the circle, such that the fluid particles, each fluid particle located at some position, has a velocity given by the local wave profile. Now, at this stage, this is merely a definition, but I am soon going to argue that essentially the same equation holds in actual hydrodynamics. Now, in order to relate the motion of this particle to uh, this time-dependent deformation, we're going to declare that the position at time t is given by this time-dependent deformation acting on a suitable initial condition. When you plug this ansatz into this equation of motion here, what you find is this equation for these time-dependent deformations. Now, this kind of equation is going to play uh, a key role throughout the talk, so let me now introduce a simplified notation for it. From now on, I'm going to rewrite this equation simply as g dot g inverse equals p. In other words, the wave profile equals the logarithmic derivative of these time-dependent deformations. Now, in mathematics, such equations are known as reconstruction equations, and therefore, these time-dependent deformations are known as the reconstruction of the wave profile. So our goal is going to be uh, to find the reconstruction of certain wave profiles sol solving KDV. Now, this is probably fairly abstract. So let me actually show you what this means in terms of the actual motion of fluid particles. That is, I'm now going to simulate a fluid on the circle whose particles satisfy this equation. Or in other words, I'm going to simulate this flow equation for time-dependent deformations. Here is a circle where I have distributed uh, a bunch of fluid particles. Notice that here the particles are not distributed uniformly. Instead, I have put a higher density of particles here on the left and the lower density on the right to reflect the shape of the wave. I'm not actually telling you which wave I'm putting here, so you just have to believe me that I am, but actually it turns out that the, the crest of the wave is located here on the left and its trough is, is located on the right. So the points of lowest density are those where the wave is lowest and the po points of highest density are those where the wa wave is highest. What's now going to happen, as you will see, is that the wave is going to propagate along the circle in a counterclockwise fashion and as it does so, you will see that all the fluid particles are going to sort of move around the circle. In particular, I have highlighted one particle here in red so that you can follow that particular particle. So now let's go. As you can see, the uh, wave is propagating and the particles are moving, and this is the end. So now the wave has essentially returned to its initial position. As you can see, the density started here and has returned here. But uh, this red particle that was initially on the right has moved all the way here. I am soon going to return uh, to this motion of fluid particles. But more generally, um, this, kind of this, this kind of behavior is quite similar to what you would expect to find in hydrodynamics. And in particular, it's tempting to ask if this is really the same thing as hydrodynamics or if there is some intrinsic difference. Now, to answer this, one first has to remember that the KDV equation was historically introduced 
as a model of shallow water waves. In that context, the coordinate that I've been calling lowercase x is actually not a fixed lab coordinate, but is instead a light cone coordinate, which is given by this kind of expression, where capital X now is a fixed lab coordinate, while this velocity v uh, is essentially the velocity of gravity waves on the surface uh, of water. And uh, furthermore, in that context, the wave profile p is in fact the deviation of depth with respect to some average depth that you've chosen. Furthermore, this depth deviation satisfies the KDV equation, and the equation of motion for fluid particles is given by this equation here. Now, is this the same as reconstruction? Well, it's clearly quite similar, because reconstruction was the statement that x dot equals p, and here we have essentially two mismatches. There's a factor 2 and a velocity v. So the question is, can we somehow redefine the parameters or the coordinates so as to remove those mismatches? Well, the first mismatch is this shift by the velocity v that you can see here. And it turns out that this is something you can absorb by redefining the Virasoro group. I'm not going to go into the details of this redefinition. It's actually sort of basic. But when you do it, just believe me that you can just uh, forget about this shift by the velocity v. So the only remaining mismatch is this factor 2 here. You might think, as I did when I initially did this computation, you might think that this factor 2 is completely innocuous, that some rescaling of space or time is just going to remove it, and that you, know, you can just forget about it. However, unfortunately, so far, I've been unable to remove this factor 2. So unfortunately, I cannot claim that what I'm describing really is hydrodynamics. At best, what I can say, and what I will say, is that the model I'm considering is indeed very, very similar to what really happens in hydrodynamics, but is not quite the same thing. So this was a digression on fluids. Now let me return to uh, the initial topic, which was to really study abstractly this uh, reconstruction equation. And at this point, I'm going to introduce one last bit of interpretation. Namely, I'm going to think of the wave profile uh, as consisting of an infinity of time-dependent parameters. Indeed, uh, this is a function on the circle, so you can expand it in Fourier modes, and when the function depends on time, these Fourier modes are obviously time dependent. Thinking of this function as uh, a set of parameters, it's natural to ask what happens when the wave is periodic so that it returns after some period t to its initial configuration. Specifically, we're going to ask what does this periodicity entail for uh, the fluid particles that solve this equation of motion? Well, in order to uh, you know, develop some intuition about this, it helps to first just solve this equation numerically for one particular choice of a periodic wave profile. Again, I'm not really going to tell you which profile I'm choosing because it really doesn't matter. It's actually a periodic soliton, but you would have essentially the same kind of behavior for any periodic solution of KDV. So uh, suppose that you have this periodic solution and plot the solution of this equation here. So this is the kind of plot you would find. Now, what's striking about this behavior is that if you look at this plot from very far away, then you see that, in fact, at late times, all the particles tend to behave linearly in time and all, in fact, uh, have the same coefficient. So in other words, all the particles tend to drift with the same drift velocity. This notion of drift velocity is the main observable we're going to focus, from, focus on from now on. In particular, I'm going to ask two questions about this notion of drift. First, why do the particles drift in the first place? And secondly, how fast exactly do they drift? It will, it will turn out that the answers to those two questions are in fact closely related. Answer, answering the why part is actually quite easy. It simply has to do with the fact that even though the wave is periodic, its reconstruction need not be. In other words, the initial configuration of the fluid, G0, need not coincide with the uh, configuration of the fluid after one period, GT. This mismatch between G0 and GT can in fact be used to estimate the drift velocity. Indeed, the latter is defined uh, by definition as uh, this late time limit of the velocity of fluid particles. But because uh, this wave profile is periodic, you can rewrite this limit as a limit in the number n of periods that, ha that have elapsed. And in that rewriting, what appears here is the nth iteration of this diffeomorphism gt g0 inverse. And obviously, if gt differs from g0, this diffeomorphism is not the identity. Now, what's nice about this rewriting is that this limit turns out to be a very well-known quantity in ergodic theory. Indeed, if you write it as delta phi, 
This number is known as the rotation number of GT Gnot inverse. In other words, delta phi is roughly the average rotation angle generated by this deformation of the circle even though I stress that this deformation generally isn't a rotation, but on average, as you can see here, it actually behaves sort of like a rotation. Now, in terms of this average rotation number, I can now, in fact, state the main claim of the talk. The main claim is that delta phi can be written as a sum of three phases, a dynamical phase, a very phase of the Virozoro type described before, and a third somewhat exotic anomalous phase. So the whole remainder of the talk is going to be devoted to the proof of this claim. And before I proceed, let me ask again, are there any questions at this stage? I hope, I hope this has been tolerable. I mean, one small question on the previous yeah. slide. So when you said you redefine your virus oral, is this just a shift of the zero mode or is it? Yes, something? it is, it is. Okay. But, but you have to do it at the level of the group. If, I mean, at least I did it at the level of the group because I'm using really the group. And then actually it's a co-cycle that I, I had never seen in the literature. I didn't know you could do it this way, but it's, it's really quite easy. Okay. On okay. the level of the algebra, it's really just shifting at zero by essentially V. Mm, okay, okay. Yes, and uh, the, the other thing, so uh, is it uh, okay or meaningful to think about this drift as a sort of a winding mode that you introduce? Um, or is this not a good way to think about ah, it? That's a good point. Uh, well, I mean, on a very sort of, um, so very loosely speaking, yes, you can think of it as a winding because it, it really is the average winding of this diffeomorphism, except that it has no reason to be integer, right? I mean, it's, in general, it's a, sure. know, yeah. it could be any angle. And in fact, we'll see later that it's essentially a continuous function. Uh, but in fact, it is true that for certain wave profiles, uh, you can really think of this as a quantized winding mode. In fact, there are certain wave profiles for which this is an integer multiple of two pi. Okay. But, okay. Uh, so I, I'm going to return to this at the very, very end of the talk, and it has to do with the um, properties of quadrant orbits of your Zorro, if you want to use yes. technical terms. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, so, I would like to, but let's go, let's come to this in the end. Thanks. There's going to be a nice structure here indeed, but for now it's still a bit hidden, but we'll get there. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, then, so let, let me proceed. Um, it's always a bit strange in these Zoom meetings because you ask people no questions and there's, and there's just complete dead silence. And, you know, in an actual seminar, you wouldn't have this, but I'm getting used to it. This is already my, my fourth Zoom talk. So anyway, um, I now want to relate this statement here. So I want to prove that delta phi really has to do with your Zorberry phases. And so that's the content of the third section. Just to remind you once more of, of what I have done so far, First, I argued that adiabatic deformations give rise to very phases, that was section one. And then in section two, I showed how the reconstruction of the, of the KDV equation gives rise to time-dependent deformations, which in turn, in the case of periodic profiles, uh, gives rise to a notion of drift velocity. So my goal now is to relate these two notions, to show how drift is related to Virozoro very phases. Now, to do this, I'm going to proceed in three steps. First, I'm going to introduce the general framework of Euler equations, of which uh, the KDV equation is just one example. And then uh, I'm going to argue that all Euler equations quite generally contain uh, geometric phases. And finally, I'm going to apply this to the KDV equation. Now, in order to introduce uh, Euler equations, I'm going to start with a very simple mechanical example, namely, consider a free rigid body. By this, I mean a top, such as this one, which is floating freely somewhere in space. Uh, I stress that the top is not standing on a table, there's no table here, but it's really something that, you know, an astronaut has thrown somewhere in the International Space Station. Our goal is to describe the time-dependent configuration, the time-dependent orientation of this top. Now, to begin, notice first that because this is a free rigid body, in any inertial frame, its angular momentum vector is going to be constant. I'm going to call that constant k from now on. And as you will see, k is going to be, k is, k is going to play an important role uh, essentially until the end of the talk. Now, in practice, if we want to describe the motion of this top, it's much more convenient to introduce a non-inertial reference frame, which is attached to the top, which really rotates along with the top. Now, that frame is given by certain, is related by certain time-dependent rotations to the inertial frame we had at the start. And furthermore, from the point of view of this attached reference frame, which is non-inertial, angular momentum is in fact a heavily time-dependent quantity. 
but it is crucially related to the time independent reference momentum k by these time dependent rotations. Now, this equation is a, an elementary kinematical statement, but it turns out to be really crucial for essentially all considerations having to do with the motion of the top. Indeed, what it means is that the motion of angular momentum takes place on a sphere. Somewhere on that sphere lies the angular momentum k, which I chose as a reference point. And then somewhere else lies the motion of momentum. So here is how the moment would look like when moving on the sphere. Now, in order to actually find the shape of this black curve representing the motion of this momentum p of t, we need to put some dynamics into the game. In the case of a free rigid body, dynamics is given by the Euler equation stating that p dot is some quadratic combination of p's. Here, the wedge is just the cross product of uh, vectors in three-dimensional space. And what I'm calling i is the inertia tensor specified by the distribution of mass in the rigid body. Um, now, suppose that you can solve this Euler equation. Then you can relate angular velocity to angular momentum by declaring that angular velocity is this logarithmic derivative of the configuration, and it's proportional to the angular momentum. Because you've assumed that you know angular momentum, you can then plug it in this equation here, integrate the equation, and therefore find the complete reconstructed motion of the top. At this point, you have won the game. You have, you have now found the complete time-dependent orientation of the rigid body. You can think of this time-dependent orientation, as I said, as a path in the group of rotations. And so it's very natural to ask if one can generalize this whole construction to essentially any continuous group. So suppose you're given a group which has the algebra, that algebra is a vector space which has a dual space. Now, regardless of uh, the, detail, the technical details of these definitions, what the sort of intuition that I would like you to keep in mind is the following. The Lie group, you should think of it as consisting of positions or configurations of some mechanical system. The Lie algebra, you can think of it as consisting of velocities. And the dual space of the algebra, you, you can really think of it as a space of momenta. Now, in all Euler equations, our goal is going to be to describe, to describe time evolution as a path in the group manifold. And we're going to do this in two steps. The first step is to declare that momentum satisfies an Euler equation. Roughly speaking, this equation takes the form that p dot is some quadratic combination of momenta. I'm not going to go into the details of the definition of this wedge product for any uh, Lie group. There's actually a well-defined way to do this, but it's really not needed for you to understand the talk. So just please accept that this is the general structure of Euler equations. Once you have solved this kind of Euler equation, you can move on to the next step uh, of uh, Euler equations, which is the reconstruction equation. Reconstruction states that the velocity of the system is linear in the momentum. And again, here, there's actually an inertia that relates the two, but I'm again sk sk skipping it uh, for simplicity. Now, provided you can solve those two equations, you have actually found the complete time-dependent configuration of the system. And furthermore, these time-dependent momenta that solved the Euler equation are in fact given by these time-dependent configurations acting as group elements on this momentum k. Now, this is the last bit of abusive notation here. I'm not actually defining what this dot means. In a matrix group, this dot is essentially the adjoint representation. But in more, in, to be precise, the quadrant representation. But in uh, more abstractly groups, uh, well, again, this is the quadrant representation, but it can in general be uh, somewhat complicated. In fact, I'm going to return to this not dot notation somewhere near the end of the talk, but for now, you don't really need to know it. Instead, what's really crucial is to realize that all these ingredients appear explicitly in the KDV equation. Indeed, uh, for the Lie group, you can just take the Vera Zero group. The space of momenta is just uh, the space of wave profiles. Um, the Euler equation is the KDV equation. And as I, as I said before, the reconstruction equation is equivalent to an equation of motion for fluid particles. Furthermore, these time-dependent configurations now are time-dependent deformations. The last bit that I haven't talked about yet is this relation here. In the case of KDV, this statement tells you that all waves solving the KDV equation with one particular initial condition are in fact related to one another by deformations. In other words, if you choose some initial condition for the KDV equation and then let it evolve according to KDV, 
then all the ways that you're going to encounter a long time evolution are in fact related to one another and to some reference profile K by time dependent deformations. So in particular, you can think of these time dependent deformations as really time dependent changes of reference frames, pretty much in the same way as what happened in Thomas precession. And so it's natural to ask quite generally, if there are very phases appearing, for example, uh, when the momentum in an Euler equation satisfies well, is actually periodic with some period t. So this is a question that I'm now going to address. Now, to address this question, I'm again going to start from the intuition of the rigid body and then generalize to any other equation. So suppose that the angular momentum of a rigid body is periodic. That means, as we said, that angular momentum lies on a sphere because it's given by time-dependent rotations acting on some reference angular momentum k. And now the path actually closes. So the path here uh, makes a loop. The question we're going to ask is, what does the existence of this loop imply for these time-dependent configurations? Well, obviously, it's going to be true that gt rotating k equals g0 rotating k. This, in turn, means that g0 inverse times gt stabilizes the angular momentum k. This is, once more, a completely elementary kinematical conclusion, but it turns out to be completely crucial. Indeed, it means that G0 inverse GT is a rotation by some angle where you don't know the angle, but you do know the axis of the rotation. So that out of the two, uh, out of the three parameters that would specify in general this rotation, you already know two parameters. And you're only left with the task of finding this one last parameter, delta phi. So that's going to be our goal. In particular, I want to stress that computing delta phi in KDV really gives you access to the drift velocity. So in order to explain now how delta phi can be computed, I'm going to uh, move away from the rigid body and generalize the discussion to any arbitrary Euler equation. So here is a uh, momentum space, which is the dual over the algebra. And somewhere in that momentum space lies the momentum P0. We take P0 as the initial condition of an Euler equation, and then we let it evolve, assuming that the solution is periodic. So here is the typical solution you would find. Now, as before, all the momenta on this trajectory are in fact related by time-dependent rotations or deformations to some reference momentum k. Our task is to map every point here on this trajectory in momentum space on some time-dependent configuration gt. And we're going to do this first by choosing some initial condition g0, which maps k on p0. And then, starting from this initial condition, we will use the reconstruction equation to find the motion in configuration space. So let's do that and see what happens. As I mentioned earlier in the talk, what's crucial here is that even though the momentum is periodic in time, this need not be true of the configuration. So that GT may well be different from G0. And the difference here is uh, accounted for by this straight line. What I'm now going to do is to use this very simple uh, qualitative picture to actually compute this angle delta phi. And to do this, I'm going to use uh, the motivation from section, section one uh, of very phases. Indeed, uh, this is a closed path. So it's very tempting to integrate a Berry connection along that path and see what happens. Now, in quantum mechanics, you may recall that the Berry connection was an expectation value of this Lie algebra valued one form G inverse dG. Now, recall that the wave function was chosen to have momentum k. So in fact, it's somewhat more suggestive to write this uh, in the form written here. Now, from this expression, it's sort of obvious what would be the classical generalization of this. Indeed, G inverse DG is a Lie algebra valued one form, so you can pair it with the momentum K. And I stress now that this pairing, represented by the bra and the ket, has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. This is simply the pairing between a vector space and its dual space. Now that we have at our disposal this classical Berry connection, we can, in fact, integrate it over the closed path here and see what happens. Well, first, when you integrate it over the closed path, you get uh, a holonomy. That holonomy is a Berry phase. But by construction, the Berry phase splits in two pieces. The first is this helix integral written here. And the second is the integral of the connection along this straight line here. Now, it turns out that the helix integral is, in fact, a dynamical phase. It's proportional to energy and period. And as for the straight line, well, 
even without doing any computation, it's clear that this straight integral is going to measure the difference between GT and G0. In other words, it is going to be proportional to delta phi, the angle we're looking for. So already at this very naive stage, we can conclude that delta phi will be the sum of a dynamical phase and a berry phase. But in fact, we can go a bit further because it turns out that the delta phi coming from this integral really comes from the term G inverse DG in this connection. But there's an additional factor of K in this connection. And so I'm now going to uh, abuse notation slightly and I'm going to denote by the same letter K, both the momentum K that appears here and the component of K that appears here, which is the component of this momentum K along the generator of rotations. Now, if you're bothered by this abuse of notation, here in this equation, feel free to replace the letter K by the norm of the letter K, the norm of the vector K, and essentially you will be correct in your understanding of this formula. Now, this formula is an explicit expression for delta phi in any Euler equation with a periodic solution. And so we can now in principle apply this formula to the KDV equation. So let's do it. Let's assume we are given some uh, periodic solution of KDV, that is a function that's periodic both in space and in time now. And let's assume, well, this is not actually an assumption. Because this solves the KDV equation, this wave is automatically given by certain time-dependent deformations acting on some reference profile K. Now, this is the only point in the talk where I actually have to explain what this dot notation means. What it means is the conformal transformation law of stress tensors in CFT. More explicitly, is given by this complicated expression here, which, if you're familiar with it, involves here on the right-hand side what's known as the Schwarzen derivative of the diffeomorphism G. In practice, however, in order to follow the talk, you don't really need to know this formula. What I do want you to know is an intuition for what this formula does. So here is going to be a picture of that intuition. As you can see on the uh, horizontal plane here, I've put a circle where I have distributed uh, uniformly uh, a large number of particles. What I'm going to do is to act on that circle with certain deformations. And as I'm doing that, I will also show you the effect of those deformations on a wave profile represented here by this blue circle. Now, notice that here I'm deliberately choosing a uniform profile, a constant. That is a profile which takes the same value at all points in the circle. As you will see, I'm going to pinch the circle here on the left. The points are going to move there. And as we do this, the wave is going to be deformed. So let's do that now. As you can see, all the points have indeed converged towards this point, but the wave profile, which initially was uniform, has now been deformed into this uh, very clearly non-uniform wave. And so this is really the intuition that you should take away from this complicated formula. What this formula tells you is that when you pinch the circle at some point, you create a local maximum of the wave at that point. And that's pretty much uh, what you should know about this. Now, in accordance with this picture, I am now going to introduce one crucial technical assumption. I'm going to assume that this periodic wave solving KDV is in fact given by deformations that act on a constant flat profile. That is, I assume that the profile K, which is time independent, is not only time independent, but also space independent. It turns out that when K exists, you can actually determine, from, determine it from the knowledge of this profile P. I'm not going to go into the details of this algorithm. It's actually a well-known uh, technique, but please, at this stage, just believe me that you can find the constant K from the knowledge of the profile P. Um, I want to stress that this assumption is restrictive. Indeed, it is not true that any wave profile can be deformed in this manner into a constant. However, it's also not overly restrictive in the sense that uh, the set of wave profiles that can be deformed uh, into a constant has non-zero measure in the set of all possible wave profiles. So it's restrictive, but it's still uh, somewhat generic. Now, uh, because K is a constant, it turns out that the only diffeomorphisms that stabilize it, they leave it fixed, are rotations. In other words, um, in terms of this reconstructed path here, we know that G0 inverse times GT is a rotation by delta phi. As in the case of the rigid body, this is a crucial, uh, a very simple but really crucial statement. Because out of the infinitely many parameters that specify in general this diffeomorphism, we now know all of those parameters except for one. All we need to find now is the angle delta phi of this rotation. 
But because this is a rotation, we are precisely in the setup that I described on the previous slide, and so we can just apply the phase formula I wrote. So delta phi is the sum of a dynamical phase and the very phase. The dynamical phase in KDV is this integral of p squared, and the very phase is the expression I wrote earlier in section one for zero. zero. So now you can take this formula and apply it to your favorite um, periodic wave. So you can evaluate this very phase, you can evaluate the dynamical phase, you can plug it here and evaluate the drift velocity. And you can then compare that prediction of drift velocity with what you can see numerically. And if you do this, you will fail miserably. This is in fact what happened to Gregory Kuzirev and myself about, I guess, two, two years ago when we were doing this. Uh, and we were very disappointed because we had very good reasons to believe that this formula must work. And we just discovered that it doesn't work. So we were worried for a while that we had, you know, completely misunderstood everything. But for, fortunately, we hadn't misunderstood quite everything, but only one little crucial detail. The crucial detail is that when dealing with the reconstruction equation, the equation that I wrote for fluid particles is indeed correct, but it's only really one component out of a more general extent, centrally extended uh, reconstruction equation. And in that case, that second component of the reconstruction equation turns out to contribute a third term here on the right, a third term which, for uh, lack of a better name, we decided to call an anomalous phase. So I am now going to write uh, all three phases, the dynamical, the very phase, and the anomalous phase, in a very special simplified case of traveling wave solutions of KDV. By definition, a traveling wave is a wave that doesn't change shape in time. So in particular, it's a periodic wave, and therefore it has a well-defined drift velocity. Now, for a traveling wave, the three phases are as follows. First, the dynamical phase is the same as before. The very phase turns out to take this simplified form. I really want to stress this is the same zero zero very phase I wrote before, except I'm now applying it to the case of a traveling wave where uh, the very phase formula simplifies. And finally, the anomalous phase is this particular com combination here of P. Notice that the very phase is the only term explicitly uh, inversely proportional to the period of the wave. This is in fact how you know uh, that this is a very phase. And notice also that the anomalous phase is multiplied explicitly by the single charge. This is presumably why the anomalous phase uh, has in fact never appeared in the literature before, because most of the literature was dealing only with uh, non-centrally extended groups. If now you use this formula for drift velocity and you plug it uh, and, you've, and you compare it to the drift that you observe numerically, you find a perfect match. So uh, when Gregory and I saw this, we were very happy because, well, that's sort of what we were hoping to see. Uh, and it's really, in a sense, the main claim of our work. Now, before I conclude, there's just one technical thing that I want to note, which I think is interesting. It turns out that, as I mentioned earlier, not all wave profiles can be deformed into a constant. And that subtlety turns out to lead to interesting bifurcations of the drift velocity. So let me illustrate this. Suppose that you're considering a one parameter family of traveling waves labeled by their wave velocity V. And suppose that for every value of this velocity, you plot the corresponding drift. What, what you will find if you do this is this kind of plot. Now, as you can see, this is a very, very non-trivial function. And in fact, it turns out that in the black regions, um, the waves located here can in fact be deformed into a constant so that this formula for drift velocity applies. And so these black curves here on the right and here on the left, these black curves are explicitly given by this expression for drift velocity. But you can also notice this red region here in the middle. Now in that red region, it is impossible to deform the wave into a constant. So those are waves uh, that cannot be turned by deformations into uniform profiles. And as you can see in that region, the drift velocity behaves in a radically different manner. In fact, in that region, drift velocity coincides with the velocity of the wave corresponding to a quantized rotation number exactly equal to, to 2 pi. Now, this quantization of the rotation number turns out to in fact be deeply related to the topology of parameter space. I'm not going to go into the details for now, uh, unless there are questions, but um, essentially it turns out that the parameter space here is a quadrant orbit of the zero zero group, and that orbit turns out to be homotopic to a point in any black region, but is homotopic to a circle in the red region. And th this topological difference turns out to lead to this radically different behavior of drift velocity. 
So let me finally conclude the talk. Um, I'm going to just summarize what I've said in one sentence, namely, uh, the whole pitch of this talk was that fluid flows give rise to time-dependent deformations, which produce uh, very phases that eventually contribute to the drift of fluid particles. I actually showed this using uh, the Virozoro group, that is, I really relied on tools from conformal field theory, and uh, I also relied quite heavily on symplectic geometry, specifically on the chapter concerning other equations. Two of the important corollaries of this kind of investigation uh, were the presence of anomalous phases, which are apparently new, and uh, the observation of certain bifurcations sensitive to the topology of parameter space. Now, I'm currently working on several follow-ups of these ideas. Uh, the first has to do with the motion of fluid particles around vortex filaments. In that case, the group that you need to consider is a Katsumudi group. And another follow-up that I already mentioned uh, in the introduction has to do with berry phases of a quantum hole droplet, in particular, the Rosura berry phases of edge modes. And I hope to have more to say about these topics in, uh, in the coming months. So more generally, I hope uh, to have managed to share some of my enthusiasm for these questions with you, and to have convinced you that there is interesting physics to be found at the intersection between high energy, fluid mechanics, and to some extent also uh, condensed matter. So uh, this is the time for me to end the talk, and thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much Thank you. Uh, for the talk. So are there any questions? Yeah, so if I may, so one uh, just sort of phenomenological question. So in the application of KDV equation to, to actual uh, gravity waves or stuff like that, uh, what is the value of the central charge? I mean, by, by which parameters is it determined and what's very the good. order of magnitude? Uh, there is no order of magnitude. It's just non-zero, and that's sufficient. So all of this is classical. And in fact, if you, if you really look at the details, um, it's sort of not obvious in the way I wrote it here, but actually everything only depends on the ratio between the wave profile and the central charge. Uh, or in other words, everything depends on the ratio between K and the central charge. So the central charge itself doesn't really have any intrinsic value. As long as it's non-zero, you can just rescale it away. In fact, uh, well, I think, in, unfortunately, in Adobe, but, oh, I think so, I can Sorry, but the, this I don't get in the Virasoro algebra. The central charge is a dimensionless number that has a well-defined meaning. How, how can you rescale it to an arbitrary value? Yes, but this is classical. That is true. You have the intuition coming from quantum theory. So let me show you here. Um, uh, okay, okay, look at this. You see this equation. So we have K delta phi. Yes. Which equals a dynamical phase, forget about it, and a berry phase. Now, the right. berry phase explicitly involves the central charge. And you might yes. worry, oh, but that means that if my central charge is, you know, 1 or 10, it's not going to be, to be the same thing. But actually, the only thing you can observe is delta phi, not k times delta phi. So that when you divide both sides of this equation by k, on the left-hand side, you have what you actually observe, delta phi. But then here on the right-hand side, you have 1 plus c over k. And in fact, C over K is the only thing you can observe. And that's something that, you know, has intrinsic value. But there the, you know, the order of magnitude probably, um, I don't know. Uh, I think it's actually quite large, typically because of the shift by the velocity V. Okay, well, if it's large, that's sort of nice because then you're in the same approximation as you would be uh, in, in gravity applications I mean, of CFDs. So it's, of course, the KDV equation comes from an asymptotic expansion of the Euler equations. So you're always assuming that some parameters are small. In this case, the parameter that's small is the inverse of the velocity of these gravity waves. And so, you know, if you declare that that's, uh, the, the velocity of gravity waves is 100 in dimensionless coordinates, um, well then, you know, C over K is typically, uh, I guess, 100. Although, wait, that, is, that, is it C over K or K over C? I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'm not quite sure that the central charge, that there's any sense. In, so I think your expectation is that you want the central charge to be large. I presume well, that's sort of what you have in th mind. Th That would be the gravity uh, uh, viewpoint, yes. Yes, but I'm not sure that's actually true here. I think it's K that's large. Okay, okay. Or so then you have a more sort of uh, uh, more CFT-like central charge that is uh, order unity or smaller. Maybe, but again, I stress that, the, no, you can really see it even from the, from the KDV equation itself. So let me try, okay, this works, perfect. So if you look at the KDV equation here, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, you can just rescale the, the central charge C, uh, probably by uh, rescale, well, 
you cannot just rescale p because then you have a pp prime here so you would have to rescale presumably time and space at the same time and then you can just remove this c or no i think you can rescale p and time and then you can remove the, the central charge c because space is two pi periodic here so i don't want to rescale space but you can, it's an easy exercise. I mean, just suppose that you map P on alpha P prime. You declare that P equals alpha P prime. Where, oh, oh. P tilde, I guess. P yeah. tilde, exactly. Yeah. P <laughs> equals alpha P tilde and uh, T equals beta T tilde and express everything in terms of P tilde and T tilde. And you will see that you can remove the central charge altogether. In fact, you can also remove this factor three, by the way. Uh, in the literature on fluids, in general, this factor three is actually factor three half because uh, the literature on fluid mechanics uses different conventions. Okay, 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 I see. But that's one of the puzzles of the whole story. I mean, that's the reason why when I looked at, uh, so this is going to be a bit slow, but when I looked at the actual hydrodynamics equations, I really thought, I really thought that this factor of two could be removed. Uh, yeah. be precisely because there is such a degree of, you know, rescaling freedom in the KDV equation. But unfortunately, I, I've been unable to, to rescale it away. And sorry, if I may one more question, I don't, mean to eat up all your question time but uh in in this anomalous phase that you had um there, there was this integral expression and um well the integrand uh in principle can have a pole so so ah, does this good. happen very or? good thank you thank you this is the perfect question so actually when i share my screen do you see that i have zoom here or do you not see it because i have zoom sort of in this corner for me but maybe you guys don't see that i have my zoom screen there okay very good that's that's better so uh you see this so here re remember uh we have waves labeled by their velocity v and we plot the drift velocity as a function of v mm -hmm. now i stress that there are here two bifurcations occurring at this point here and at this point here now those points are exactly the points where p minus v has roots okay so those are exactly the points where this guy develops a pole and and when, th when that pole occurs you actually move into this regime where the wave cannot be turned into a uniform profile. Okay, okay. So there okay. really is, I mean, and that seems, I mean, I, I wrote another paper, which I, I haven't talked about today, but I think it was not known that in the KDV equation, there's a relation between Bursoro orbits and the roots of this guy. Um, and there really is. Well, this guy has roots if and only if uh, the profile P cannot be made uniform. Okay, okay, thanks, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the good questions. Uh, so just so that I really I understand this properly. So you're saying that when, when, when this has roots is exactly the case that you said when you cannot make the profile, you cannot find the transformation that maps to exactly. the profile. Exactly, exactly. So stating that uh, my profile P can be mapped on a constant, that it does have uh, a uniform representative, that assumption is equivalent in the case of traveling waves to the requirement that p minus v is always non-zero at every point on the circle. So whenever p minus v is everywhere non-zero, p can in fact be deformed into a constant. And conversely, if p minus v does have roots, then you cannot deform p into a constant. Even by um, what you would call a, a large diffeomorphism? Or? Oh, you mean something that's not actually diffeomorphism of the circle, but that has some winding or some, oh, well, that I don't know. That I wouldn't dare say. I think the answer is probably no, because the... Because you mentioned that it's connected also to the topology of your space of parameters. So, I mean, in, in technical terms, uh, this P minus V term also appears in the diffeomorphism that maps P on a constant. If you actually want to write the map that sends P on a constant, you have to write something like integral of one over p minus v. You really have that appearing. Um, and so when this guy has poles, that diffeomorphism becomes, you know, it's not smooth. It, it's not even a matter, a matter of winding many times over the circle, but it's really a non-smooth transformation of the circle. It's actually discontinuous. So I think the answer to your question would be no, even by a large diffeomorphism, lar large diffeomorphism in the sense, something that's not a diffeomorphism, but winds around the circle. I think you, you would still be unable to map such a P on a constant. Okay. Thanks. Are there any other questions?
I have a, another question related to this factor of two problem that you had a I mean, yeah. problem, but uh, mismatch. Okay. So it was uh, here, I guess. So do you know if you can just uh, maybe cook up a system which is not um, not hydrodynamics, but which would not have this factor of two? Ah, I, so I really don't know. I would be really happy to do it, but I don't know. Uh, actually, there is sort of a trivial answer to this question, and the answer is yes. But as I said, it's sort of trivial. So um, it turns out that, uh, so how am I going to, ex to explain this? So. I was describing everything in terms of time-dependent deformations of a circle. Now, it turns out that those time-dependent deformations, you can, re you can in fact write them formally as the time-ordered exponential of this wave profile P of X and T. Uh, time-ordered exponential really in the sense of, a, uh, of an evolution operator in one-dimensional quantum mechanics with a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And in fact, if you choose your Hamiltonian to be a function P of X and T, d over dx, so you know this function times the momentum operator, and you complete it so that it becomes Fermission, then in fact you, have Im you immediately have a quantum system that automatically behaves exactly in the way I've described. The problem is that this is a bit ad hoc because there is no reason for you to require this quantum mechanical Hamiltonian to satisfy the KDV equation. This is just, some, I mean, you could, presumably you could do an experiment where this is satisfied, but there is no natural reason, I guess, in physics to, to do it that way. So in that sense, I, ha I have yet to find a system where x dot equals p is realized exactly. Although I have to say, my hope is still that this factor of two can in fact be somehow removed perhaps by, I mean, something I was thinking about the other day is just to have one left moving coordinate, another right moving one. And then maybe in the sum between the two, you can actually remove this factor of two somehow. I'm, I've tried all these things so far and it has always failed, but I'm not losing hope. I, I do believe, I, I do hope at some point that I'm going to figure it out, but maybe I won't, who knows. Okay, thanks. Thanks, it's a, it's a good, it's a technical question, but it's a, it's a very good question. So uh, my question would be that uh, like here, the equation you use to is always like, equation related to group structure so you are always like restricted to specific equation you can't uh, like yes. a general model there is no hope to put it in this form for example because like quantum hole effect is more applied to a wide variety of model here is more like for specific group or... so well yes but the so the power of these Euler equations so let me return to the page on Euler equation which is presumably here um, the power of this kind of equation, p dot equals p wedge p, is that, so it's a nonlinear evolution equation, uh, but it's remarkably generic. Um, in fact, the KDV, so for example, you were mentioning the quantum hole effect. Uh, there's a paper by Caruzotto and some other collaborator. It's a recent paper from 2020, where they show that uh, in some approximations, the edge modes of the quantum hole effect satisfy a nonlinear wave equation such that the density uh, of edge modes satisfies KDV, in fact. They really find a good matching between some numerical experiments that they run and KDV dynamics. So, uh, uh, oh, I wasn't aware of that paper. It's like, even in the, with linear systems, they achieve to obtain nonlinear equation for the edge mode? So that's what they claim. Um, and I'm, so I've read the paper uh, and I don't quite understand their arguments, especially because they are in fact in the integer quantum hole effect. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I would expect the wave equation there to be linear, but they claim that if the, um, um, if the, uh, I guess, the slope of the, uh, of energy varies, uh, then in fact, there are nonlinear effects that can be incorporated by the KDV equation. Having said this, you don't actually need to use that paper. There's a paper by Wigman uh, from a few years ago, I think to 2016, where he describes nonlinear edge modes of the fractional quantum hole effect. Um, mm. And again, the kind of equation that you find in that case is typically of an Euler type. Uh, there's actually sort of a renormalization group argument for why Euler equations are uh, more or less universal. And it has to do with the fact that their, um, their Hamiltonian is quadratic and their symplectic form is the natural one from the point of view of group theory. So whenever you have a configuration space that's a group, 
uh, essentially at low energies, the first thing you're going to see is Euler dynamics. And that's sort of why the KDV equation is universal. In fact, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is also an Euler equation. And that's sort of everywhere in nonlinear science. So yeah. this is indeed for specific models, but these specific models are surprisingly generic. Okay. This yeah, is why they know. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Thanks thank you question. very much for you, your answer. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Good. So maybe, maybe if we have no more questions, then let's thank again the speaker.